the problem is that we let it. And that's the difference between the, the, the colonial experience and the experience of us in here in the 21st century. The colonials did not let it happen. They rose up at the very first sign of overreach. And too many Americans today just let it go. And I think even encourage it. Welcome to the Tennessee Informer. I'm your host, Dave Vance. Welcome to our 4th of July special. Our special guest today is none other than Mike Meharry from the 10th Amendment Center. Mike is the Communications Director and is from the original home of the Principles 98 Kentucky. He currently resides in Central Florida and is the author of the books, Our Last Hope, Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty and the Constitution Owner's Manual. He has a blog at the 10th Amendment Center as well and you can visit his personal website at Michael meharry.com and like him on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on the show again. I really appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate all the great material that you put out. I would encourage anybody that hasn't read your material or hasn't read it recently to get back on the 10th Amendment Center and, and look your stuff up because you, you, know, you, you put out stuff pretty regular and uh, you, you've got a pretty good volume there and good body of work and I appreciate all that. Yeah, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I'm kind of, kind of gonna. <laughs> I uh, I was actually looking the other day. I've written over five thousand articles and blogs that have been published on the Tenth Amendment Center site in about a little over fourteen years. So wow, there's a lot of stuff up there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know. I didn't realize it was that many. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> fourteen years. That's a good haul. Yeah. Well, we do appreciate everything you do, and, and the, it's, the, the articles are really well written. Um, so, 4th of July, Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence. Uh, you know, the, the road to the Declaration of Independence was a long one, and it started out with peaceful resistance. Uh, can you tell us about what is described as the long train of abuses in the Declaration of Independence? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that the um, run-up to the American Revolution really started long before. You can go all the way back to 1765 with the Stamp Act is when I really think things started to kind of come to a head. And, you know, if you, if you read the Declaration of Independence, I don't think a lot of people go much past the well-known preamble, you know, uh, that we have, uh, you know, God-given rights and that we have the right to abolish our government. People are very familiar with that. I don't think most people read all the way down to the bottom where Jefferson actually listed all of uh, or many of the grievances that the colonists had. And uh, I think people make that your mission this 4th of July holiday to, to take the time to read the entire declaration because it is enlightening. But I think you can really boil it down to this. It was, in a sense, a constitutional crisis. And I don't think it's framed that way very often in government schools these days. But that's really what it was. The, the British government didn't have a written constitution like we do. They had what was known as kind of an oral constitution. But there was a constitution. And the colonists referred to that quite often, especially in the early days of their protests against what, the, what they viewed as British overreach, uh, taxation and legislation coming from Parliament that they felt was not really justified. We tend to think of the revolution in terms of taxation without representation, and that was a small part of it. But what was more, I think, oppressive feeling to the colonists was this idea that Parliament could uh, legislate in all manners whatsoever, as the, as the Parliament put it, uh, after they repealed the Stamp Act. So that's really the crux of the matter. The American colonists felt like the British were abusing their power as a government and violating this unwritten constitution that had been in place really since the 1600s when the colonists began migrating over to the New World. So it was definitely a very long 
and drawn out process. It didn't start in 1776. It started a decade before. And we saw this kind of ramp up of resistance and protest and, and kind of coming in waves over the years leading up to the revolution. So I think another thing that's interesting is John Adams, when he was talking about the revolution later, he said that the real revolution was actually a revolution in thought, a change in ideas. And you really see this as you begin to study the the rhetoric of the founding generation, especially the the really diehard patriots in those early years. They talked a lot about the idea that government was meant to serve the people, not the other way around. And in the British conception of government, government was sovereign. Government was supreme. Government had ultimate authority. And the colonists, influenced heavily by folks like John Locke and others, uh, they began to conceive of a system where the government wasn't sovereign, the people are sovereign, and the government serves as the people's agents. And that was really kind of this, this change in thinking is really what underpinned the American Revolution and then later the, uh, the development of the U.S. system of government on a written constitution that was intended to keep that central authority relatively limited. I think it's interesting, and I don't want to get off track here because the focus is the Declaration, but, you know, basically Britain said, even even after they repealed the Stamp Act, okay, hey, just so you know, we have the right to lay down laws for you on any topic, okay? So mm-hmm. so don't forget that. We, we are supreme. We can do anything we want. And we are told and have been told, I know most of my life and most of your life, that the federal government, and via primarily the Supreme Court, but that all federal laws and all edicts, which are really just opinions from the Supreme Court, are they can do it on anything. That, that, that they, I, I, see, I see a similarity there. And to me, it's kind of ironic that we're going to celebrate independence, yet a good chunk of the people in our country, and certainly almost all of the lawyers in our country, believe that the federal government, and especially through the courts, can rule for us on anything. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that's an important lesson to take away from the, uh, the founding era. You know, the old revolutionaries and, and the founding fathers, that was their gripe. And we've almost <laughs> reverted back to that very same system. Not with the courts. I mean, not just with the courts. Certainly, the courts are, are probably the biggest part of it. But, you know, even looking at the way presidents operate today, you know, you, you remember uh, Obama and, you know, I've got my pen and my phone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he said that, so it makes for a great quote. But, I mean, you know, Trump operated on the same premise. Biden operates on the same premise. Right. Bush before him operated on the same premise. Yeah. So so we've really reverted, I think, in a lot of ways. And, and I think that's a good thing for folks to reflect on as we have this Independence Day holiday is to kind of look back on, hey, this is what our our founding generation fought and died for. And maybe we should really consider that it, it's beh- up, incumbent upon us to, to kind of uphold those values and, and try to reassert those values today. Yeah. And I don't think they ever thought that they were creating a republic that would have an election for a president and it's essentially a winner take all type mentality. Oh, no, absolutely not. So I think Absolutely that shows not. how far away we've gotten uh, from from their original intent and, and certainly from the Constitution. Mm-hmm. So, so prior to Lexington and Concord, how what were some of the things that the colonists did to resist? Well, they did a lot of things, and you know it's really interesting. I I, I wasn't really aware of kind of the pre-revolutionary history, that kind of run-up history from 1765 to 1775 until relatively recently, and. Over that time, I've done a lot of reading and studying on resistance to the Stamp Act and and all of the other acts that followed. And it's really interesting because there was kind of this tandem that worked together. There were protests and resolutions. Um, You know, you look at the resolutions that came up around the Stamp Act. You know, Patrick Henry really rose to prominence with his opposition to the Stamp Act and uh, pushing through resolutions in Virginia that that went as far as to say, you know, we're not going to comply with this action. And so you had these kind of official things that brewed up. 
uh, from kind of the, the body politic. And then on the other hand, you had kind of boots on the ground protests that were going on at the same time. And I think most people today would find the the things that some of the colonists did rather shocking and, and probably appalling by our standards, judging by the, the brouhaha caused by the January 6th insurrection. You know, <laughs> that yeah. was nothing compared to what some of the protesters did uh, to protest the Stamp Act and these other acts. I mean, you know, the Boston Tea Party is well known, uh, pitching the tea into the, into the harbor. But during the Stamp Act, they literally, you know, uh, hung uh, people who were uh, complying with the Stamp Act in effigy. Uh, they they burned some folks' houses down, and I'm not recommending this, but this is what they did. It was not nearly as peaceful as people might imagine, uh, even in those early years. But I think the real key, and, and, and the really interesting thing about the Stamp Act to me is that because of colonial noncompliance, because they refused to use the stamp paper, because they refused to allow uh, the stamp uh, issuers, the paper issuers, to even take their posts. Because of this this refusal to comply, the British were ultimately forced to repeal the Stamp Act because they couldn't enforce it. It was unenforceable because the people would not submit to it. And it's interesting because this was the rhetoric that was floating around out there during the time. John Dickinson is known as the penman of the revolution. Uh, he, he wrote a series of, uh, of essays and papers during the um, during the Stamp Act and up to the to the uh, revolution and then he was also very prominent in the ratification of the Constitution and John Dickinson warned writing in opposition to the Stamp Act he said if you simply comply you unnecessarily voluntarily establish the detestable precedent which those who have forged your fetters ardently wish for and, and make no mistake, he, the point he was making is that once this precedent is set, the government's going to build on it and find even more ways to exercise their new claimed authority. And, uh, you know, he went on and he wrote, if you quietly bend your necks to that yoke, you prove yourselves ready to receive any bondage to which your lords and masters shall please to subject you. Thank so this COVID. was the kind of... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so this was the kind of rhetoric. And I think there's a lesson in that for us, that noncompliance, when the government steps over the line, noncompliance is a legitimate and justifiable reaction to that. And, you know, it, it can be done in a nonviolent way, simply by just refusing to do it. You know, if if uh, you, you've got a vaccine mandate, don't get vaccinated. If uh, you know, if the government comes along and tells you, oh, you have to turn in X, Y, Z firearm, don't do it. Uh, I wrote an article not too long ago, and this is, this is kind of getting way off the subject, but I think it's, it fits into the theme that we're discussing here. In the 1930s, uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued what was known as a gold confiscation order. Yep. And, you know, I'm not going to delve into the background. You can find that on 10th Amendment Center website if you're interested. But the long and short of it is, the government wasn't able to confiscate much gold because most people just didn't turn it in. <laughs> so this is a lesson that, that goes all the way back to you know 1865, and it's an important lesson to learn. Resistance is important. Noncompliance is important. It's so important that James Madison wrote in Federalist Number 46 that one of the ways to stop the federal government from overreaching would be to refuse to cooperate with officers of the Union. So this mindset really started long before the founding of the United States with the, uh, I like to call them the old revolutionaries, people like Dickinson's and Samuel Adams and John Adams and those folks, the the Sons of Liberty and, and all of those folks. They did other things as well. They, they organized boycotts. They boycotted British goods. They uh, did things to make it difficult for the British government to continue exercising what they viewed as unwarranted control. And, uh, and and that's really the legacy of the American Revolution. And uh, we definitely have to start doing a lot more of that in this day and age at all levels, whether it's state overreach or federal overreach, although I think federal overreach is, uh, is by far the worst right now. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to I tend to start with federal overreach because if you can if you can start to to unwind that, at least you have some decentralization going on and, and then and then you know when you in a decentralized system 
there are more escape valves and, and more competition yeah. between jurisdictions. You know, I know a lot of folks have moved to Tennessee. A lot of folks have moved here to Florida over the last couple of years because they saw what happened with the COVID regime. They see what's happening with, you know, burn some state taxes. So they're looking for places with more liberty and, and basically they're voting with their feet. And that is the beauty of federalism. That's not to say that Tennessee is perfect or it, Florida is perfect. It's <laughs> yes, far from it. Uh, it's got its own set of problems, but yeah. people can vote with their it, with their feet and escape the more burdensome uh, jurisdictions. And, and that kind of creates incentives in other jurisdictions to say, hey, maybe we ought to lay off some of this stuff. Yep. So that's the beauty of a decentralized system. And again, that was something that the, that the founders recognized. And that was really kind of their argument during the revolutionary era, they were saying, hey, we've got 13 colonies here. They're very different. Uh, you know, there's great cultural and, and uh, uh, you know, other differences between folks in New York and folks in South Carolina. We don't need one size fits all government from the parliament. We have had the right all of these years to basically self-govern for our own legislatures, our own bodies to, to tax us and, and make the laws that that fit in with, you know, our local jurisdiction. They resented Parliament because it was this overreaching, centralizing hand that was trying to, you know, come from afar across the ocean. And you know, if you think about it, somebody in in uh, Arizona, I mean, Washington D.C. might as well be as across the ocean. So there's a lot of parallels there. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it seems that you mentioned the, the decentralization. Those that that talk of, of our country as okay, you know, the federal government gets to control everything. Well, number one, they don't. It's it's not really written that way. It's often interpreted that way. But that's not even true today. It's just like you said, people leave the more oppressive states, come to states that they think are less oppressive. Uh, they come to Tennessee, and a lot of times they're disappointed. They're shocked and surprised <laughs> that this is going on in Tennessee. But right. hey, it's still better than New York. It's still better than California. And mm -hmm. the thing is, you have somewhere to go. When you mm -hmm. have a top-down system that, you know, if everything is uniform, if there is no variance, then you've got you got nowhere to go, nowhere to nowhere to escape to, nowhere to hide. And, and so exactly. I think people need to make, you know, be thankful for that. That's another thing to be thankful for, uh, and to use some of the ideas from the founding generation. I, I think that, I think, I know a lot of them are a little harder, but not all of them, a lot of them would still transfer to today in terms of what we could do. Whether yeah, it's absolutely. boycotts or resisting, you know, we know it's an election year, so I'm sure they're going to have some sort of disease out there, uh, <laughs> you know, some sort of lockdown, I'm sure, between now and November. I wouldn't be at all shocked. And, you know, the, the whole idea of federalism is is really, again, it's rooted in the American Revolution. You look at the Declaration of Independence. Each state de ultimately declared independence independently, right? If, if, a, if, a, if a one of the colonies had decided, hey, we don't want to uh, declare independence, they, they weren't obligated to, right? right? And when you look at the end of the revolution, when the British finally capitulated, and you go to the Treaty of Paris, which yep. was the, the end, the British government recognized 13 sovereign independent states. It yep. wasn't one big glob. Right, right. It was never one big glob. It wasn't one big glob when, when it was colonial. It wasn't one big glob during the revolution. It wasn't one big glob when they uh, ratified the Articles of Confederation, and it still wasn't one big glob when they ratified the Constitution. It was a union of sovereign states that delegated specific powers to the federal government and retained most of the power for themselves. And that was the colonial system. That's what they were fighting Britain over because the British had allowed that system to exist for so many years and then all of a sudden decided, well, we need some more revenue. So, so we're going we're gonna to crack down on these colonies. Yeah. And uh, it didn't work out so well for the British in, yeah. the, in the long run. Yeah, follow the money. Uh, you know, it, as, as I've, I've done a little bit of reading on this, and I, I think they always had some taxes from uh, Britain, but they were kind of blown off and they weren't really enforced. Right. And then after the French and Indian War, you know, Britain was hurting, and that's when they kind of put the hammer down, and that's that was the start of the problems. Right. Uh, but it just and, got and worse think, from there. 
I think the fact that the the colonists reacted so aggressively against the tax act or the stamp act, I think that that caused the British to kind of dig their heels in too, and and to make that statement. Well, we can legislate in all matters whatsoever. You know, I, I think they were like, okay, we're going to prove a point, and then it became, you know, a a, a, a battle of wits, uh, not a battle of wits, a battle battle of wills. Right. And uh, you know, it's really pretty amazing when you think about it. When you look at the odds that the Americans faced, you know, they were facing down literally an empire, the largest oh. government you know that existed on the planet at that time, the most powerful force in the world. And, uh, and and they were able to prevail over that. And it's pretty amazing. So it kind of should give you hope. I think a lot of people get discouraged. You know, we look at the size and scope and, and the aggressiveness of the federal government today. And I think, well, we can't we can't do anything about this. But I think I think you can, because, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for determined people who, who are willing to, uh, you know, put things on the line for for their freedom and liberty. Yeah. And of course, I think the key is getting your states on board. I think that's mm -hmm. the only way to do it effectively. I mean, that's a that's a nullification discussion. But um, I think that's important. You know, another thing that the, the challenge during the revolution is not everybody was on board with the revolution either. And I've, oh, no. I've heard different numbers. Uh, I don't know exactly. I've heard it's three percent. I've heard 20. I don't know what the numbers are. But I know everybody was not on board with it. You had people who were like, I really don't care. You had people who were like, no, we're British. And, you know, I'm totally against breaking away from the mother country. So uh, that, they had that challenge as well. It, it was like a civil war within a revolution. Yeah, that's very true. And, and that goes to the importance of, of messaging and of, you know, teaching and educating. And I think that was really the power of some of these resolutions that were were brought about. And it wasn't just at the at the state level. Uh, there were a lot of local uh, conventions, so to speak. You know, they called them committees of... Uh, correspondence. Uh, exactly, committees yeah. of correspondence. I'm glad you pulled that, that word. I wasn't going to remember that. Um, but, you know, they, they were local. They were at the county level. They were at the city level. And these folks would come together and they would issue these resolutions and people would read them. You know, they'd post them on the on the, probably not lamp posts, but, you know, wherever they could post things like that. And they would be in the newspapers and folks would read these. And, and so slowly public opinion was swayed. I'm sure in the early days, it was a very small number. And then as you got closer to 1776, more and more people got on board. But, you know, it's interesting, even John Dickinson, even up to, you know, Jefferson had already drafted the Declaration of Independence and Dickinson was still pushing the Continental Congress to, hey, let's try to reconcile. Let's try to, uh, you know, let's try to end this peacefully. Let's try to make this work. Uh, so even within, you know, the, the power structure, there were still very prominent people who didn't really want to go to war. Uh, but interesting, Dick, when, when it did come to war, Dickinson was one of the first to uh, actually take up arms. Well, and, and think about it, too. So the declaration is in 76, but the fighting, the real fighting actually started in 75. Right. In the spring, you know, uh, April 19th, you know, with Lexington and Concord, when they decided they were going to come and, and take the arms and, and the powder there in Massachusetts. And, you know, obviously the locals are the ones that responded. But soon after that, you had people from the other colonies come in there. You have the Battle of Bunker Hill. Right. Uh, and, and so they fought for over a year before right. they finally made their Declaration of Independence. Yep, and not not long after Lexington, Lexington and Concord, there was a significant battle in North Carolina. It's often uh, been called the the North or the uh, Lexington and Concord of the South, uh, in, a, in kind of a similar situation where uh, a couple of militias did some sparring, and, and North Carolina was actually one of the first states to. Uh, to actually declare independence. A number of states had already effectively declared independence before the Declaration of Independence was, was drafted and ratified. Uh, several states already had drafted state constitutions. So they were on the road to independence before the, the declaration. That was kind of the, the formalization of what was going on and, and then a, a unification, a commitment, hey, we're all going in this direction. Right, right. And, and they thought, of course, that... Uh 
when it was actually written on July the 2nd. They thought July 2nd, I think Adams and, I think it was Adams and uh, Jefferson, yeah. thought that July 2nd would be a date remembered, but it, it, I guess it got finalized on the 4th, so that's what we remember and that's what we uh, right. celebrate. Um, so, let me get, okay. All right, so how did, how did these experiences of the revolution, you know, pre-revolution and during the revolution, how did those things affect the creation of our Constitution? That's a great question. So I think the biggest thing is, it kind of goes back to what Adam said about this, this revolution of ideas, that there was a fundamental shift in thinking where the government was no longer the sovereign. The government was no longer the master of the people. The people were the masters of government and government was the servant. There was this idea that was developed throughout the, uh, the pre-revolutionary years, and then it continued to grow during the American Revolution, that government should be of the people, by the people, <clears throat> and for the people. It's this whole idea of agency. Right. And you see that uh, a lot in some of the rhetoric that surrounded the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, for instance, John Jay. He said, the Constitution only serves to point out that part of the people's business, which they think proper by it, to refer to the management of the persons therein designated. So you see this, this kind of agency relationship. We have an agent, which is the, the, the worker, and then the people that it serves. Uh, Patrick Henry put it this way. He said, the governing persons are the servants of the people. And, of course, we know that no servant is greater than the master. So that means that the people are in charge. They, we have final authority. So that really, I think, is, is kind of foundational in the Constitution. And you see it in the fact that they specifically delegated powers to the federal government. And they said, you can do these things and all of these other things you cannot do. So you, you see this, this whole idea of agency in the very structure of the Constitution itself. The fact that there was a written Constitution was really a, uh, a response to the way things unfolded with the, uh, with the British and the colonists. There was an unwritten Constitution, and it made it very difficult to kind of refer to it because the Parliament would just claim, well, we are the Constitution, so whatever we say goes. And so this idea that the Constitution should be written down, that, that the, uh, the power should be specifically delegated, explicit, so that there's no question. They hoped that there would be no question. We write this down, we say you can do this list of things, that it would be self-evident that all of the other things were off limits. Now, as it turns out, uh, I think they underestimated the, the, the power of government. Yep. And the tendency to overgrow, and 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 to be fair, many people in that founding generation warned us. Uh, George Mason yep. spoke very strongly. Uh, he was an anti-federalist. He did not uh, support the ratification of the Constitution, and he warned about this propensity of power. That power tends to grow. That right. once people get power, they tend to want more power, and that you can't trust people with power. So that's why he was so emphatic about a Bill of Rights, because he felt like that, that we need to put every precaution in place that we can because of this, this tendency of power to grow. But certainly, uh, it, it was a, uh, a very strong impetus to delineate and mark out the, the, uh, the powers of the government, and that was a direct result of the experience with the British. And you also see it in, in specific, uh, you know, ways that the Constitution is set up. For instance, compared to a king, the president is very limited. You know, the president right. is only supposed to be an executive to put laws into effect and to run the executive offices that, that kind of make things tick. The president has no legislative authority under the Constitution. Again, this was a direct result of the colonist experience with the king, right. who would make edicts. Uh, unfortunately, today we have presidents who make edicts, and yeah. uh, far too many people pay attention to those edicts. Yeah. Uh, but So you see it not only in kind of the overriding underlying principles that support the Constitution, but you also see it in the specific division of powers, you know, uh, delineating the, uh, the, the differences between the judicial and the legislative and the executive. And then I think maybe one of the most significant is this idea 
of federalism that is really encapsulated by the 10th Amendment, that the federal government only has the powers that are delegated to it, yep. and the states have every other power unless it is specifically prohibited by the Constitution. Again, this goes back to this whole idea that Parliament was you know, supreme, and we're going to tell you what to do, and we can uh, legislate in all manners whatsoever, all subjects whatsoever. No, the 10th Amendment makes it very clear. You, federal government, have a very limited scope of powers. And again, uh, that has kind of gone by the wayside. And, yep. you know, the problem is that we let it. And that's the difference between the, the, the colonial experience and the experience of us in, here in the 21st century. The colonials did not let it happen. They rose up at the very first sign of overreach. And... Too many Americans today just let it go, and I think even encourage it because we've 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 devolved into this very partisan world, where so many people are are kind of gathered around their favorite political figure, whether it's yeah. Trump, whether it's Biden, whether it's I don't know, Kennedy, whoever, some libertarian president, I, whoever it is, and we've lost sight of the fact that. We can't trust these people. It has to be a a. It has to be the people that are keeping the system in check, right? Yep. Just as as they said. So, when we see this drift away, it's really our fault. And in this hyper partisan world, I think when you know their guy is in control. So, so if you're you know right now, Democrats are like, well, let Biden do whatever he wants because Biden is great and and Biden's going to make things great, and then. Sadly, I saw some of the same things when Trump was in office, that we're going to let him get away with stuff because he's our guy. Yeah. Well, you can't do that. Your fidelity has to be to the Constitution first, yeah. the Constitution and the rule of law. And you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't support one candidate or one candidate's not better than another, but I'm saying that you shouldn't – you should hold your candidate. I think that Trump supporters, if he is to get reelected, they need to be more diligent in holding his feet to the fire on constitutional issues than they even were with Biden because it's his own people that will keep him in check. Yeah. And, you know, the same thing. And it's interesting because whenever the other guy gets in power, this side, the you know, the other side throws a fit. It's like – Oh my gosh, you know, it, when when Trump was elected, you had all of these people on the left. Oh my gosh, we you were giving this power to this dictator, which obviously <laughs> overblown silliness. Yeah. But they were more than happy for Obama to exercise all of this extra power. Right. They gave it to him. The power is always going to pass on to the next person. Yeah. So whatever you let the guy that is in office now get away with, you have to remember and think about, do you want that power to be in the next person's hands if they are not uh, favorable to my political position? I, I've, I've heard it, it's kind of told as a joke, but it, it kind of brings it home. It's like, you have to think about, you know, would you want to give this power to your ex-wife? <laughs> you know, that's kind of what you're doing. Well, obviously, no, you don't want your ex-wife to have any power over you whatsoever. So right. you need to limit the power at the get-go, and that has been the big failure. And that was the success of the colonists. They saw this, the Stamp Act passed. They said, no, line in the sand, you're not going over it. And uh, we never drew the lines in the sand, so now we've got a federal government that's telling you how much water you can have in your toilet. You yeah. know, for goodness yeah. sake. Well, you know, and here's the thing that's kind of ironic, and, and really it's it's more shame on our current generation and in recent generations. So the colonists, they were subjects. They weren't citizens. They didn't have a written constitution, but they knew what their rights were, and they weren't going to just sit back and go along with it. And like you say, it was a revolution of the mind, okay? Mm -hmm. now, you know, they didn't accept that, well, the, the king gets to do whatever he wants because he's the king. And so before then, we were subjects. Well, now we're citizens. We have a written constitution, okay? It, 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 it's, it's all written out. And we just allow them to do so many things that they're clearly not allowed to do. I, you know, so many people think that the way our government is structured is federal, state, local, and right. that's that's you know it's not accurate, um, and and but they're not taught the right thing, and nobody's been taught the right thing for decades. Yeah. And if you do bring it up, they look at you like you got two heads. 
I really encourage folks to read Federalist Number 45. It was written by James Madison, and he gives the most clear and succinct explanation of what the system is supposed to look like that I've ever seen. And I can, I can summarize it pretty, pretty easily. He said, the powers delegated to the federal government by the proposed Constitution, because keep in mind, this was pushing for ratification. He said, the powers delegated to the federal government by the proposed Constitution are few and defined. And he said, those which are left to the people and the states are numerous and indefinite. So those are the words he used, few and defined for the federal government, numerous and indefinite for the states. And then he went on and he kind of clarified what he meant. He said, most of the powers that are delegated to the federal government are to involve things like foreign policy, war and peace, foreign trade, those types of things. And he said, all of the things that pertain to the life, liberty, and prosperity of the people would be left to the people in the states. So that really just Boom, that's what it's supposed to look like. So we should always go back and look at Madison's explanation, again, in support of the Constitution, and look at what we've got today and compare those two things. Now, obviously, we've absolutely flipped it on its head. We have a federal government that exercises numerous and indefinite powers, and then it tries to keep the states in that few and defined category. And you're exactly right. You know, people look at it, oh, we've got the federal government, and then the states are under that, and then the local government. It should be the other way around. It should be local government, state government, federal government. Because governments that, that's closest to home is the government that is going to be the most responsive to the needs and the desires of the people. And again, this goes all the way back to the American Revolution, right? The, the colonists resented these people that were across the ocean, they had no idea what their experiences were. They had no idea what they were dealing with. They had no idea of their environment or their culture or anything, and they've got these people making laws for them. And that's no different than today when we have people in Washington, D.C., where even our own rep representatives spend most of their time in Washington, D.C. They don't know what's going on in, right. in you know, Shelbyville, Tennessee, or, you know, Murfreesboro or, or Knoxville. They don't know. So why should we have these people that are at such a distance legislating? In fact, many of the founders warned about this. Thomas yep. Jefferson talked about it directly. He said the country is too big to be ruled by people far away in, in a distant land. And, he, and this was when... The country was far smaller than it was today, and he warned you'd, in, you'd end up with hordes of people, you know, and corruption, and all of the things that, that Jefferson said would happen is exactly what we've got today. Yeah. So, it would benefit us to decentralize and localize our governments, governance because it would be more responsive to us, and yet, I think people have this mentality of, well, I want this thing. So let's go get it done in Washington, D.C., because that's easier, right? It's right. easier to impose will over everybody instead of, of, of allowing each locality to, to do what it wants. And, I, and some of it's, I think, unfortunately, this kind of busybody mentality, right? I, I just can't stand that somebody somewhere else might be doing something different than me. Right. And people, people get riled up about, you know, well, in California, they're doing da, -da. <laughs> I don't care what they're doing in California. I care in so far as that stuff tends to get exported. Right. But if California wants to like have their own state-run healthcare system, let them do it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it'll fail, which would be a good life lesson for the rest of us. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that people need to to not be so hung up on we've got to have everything universal and uniform because nobody lives like that, right? Right. You don't want me to force you to live like I live. You know. Right. I mean, you may. You may hate Florida. <laughs> it's too humid. You know, too many mosquitoes, whatever. I certainly don't want to live anywhere where it's cold. So, you know, and, and those are obviously silly things, but the same is true of policy. We have, I'm sure, lifestyle differences and different, um, you know, values and, and different upbringings. We're different people. Yeah. So why should we have one-size-fits-all government? And that was what the colonists were arguing as well. They didn't want one-size-fits-all one government from London. They didn't want one-size-fits-all government from a central government. They wanted to decide at the state and local level. And, and I think they were absolutely right about that. You can look at some of the things maybe that the founding generation, you know, misunderstood or got wrong, you know, because it was what, you know, 
200 and however many years ago. But that they absolutely got right. So when do you think this started? I mean, I know some of these and some of them are pretty obvious, but so, of course, now we have all this globalism, but a lot of this started well before this whole globalist push. So in terms of how we got to where we are now, how, what's your timeline on that, on how things got to where we are now? I think things, I think things really shifted uh, during and after the Civil War. I think that's when you really started to see this this kind of this idea of, of nationalism that we all and, and it was you know it was an understandable reaction to a division that led to bloody conflict. And I think that's where we really started to see this rhetoric. And I think people who wanted more power used it to their advantage to take more power. And so kind of piggybacking on this idea that we need to be unified, uh, it became a political thing where that unification became, you have to be subject to your masters in D.C. because we wouldn't want another civil war, you know. <laughs> um, I really think that's kind of the, the root of the change. And then the mentality began to shift and, and people started looking to, you know, the holy city, <coughs> the holy city in the swamp, <laughs> and uh, and kind of got us to where we are today. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't necessarily have to turn out that way even after the Civil War. But, you know, if you look at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, you had certain, uh, I think it was called the, the uh, Dick Act, which had to do with the militias, where it not yeah. only, if I recall correctly, not only kind of uh, standardized the training among the state militias, but it gave more federal control to the state militias. And then later on, you had, of course, the income tax. And that's where right. it really went all downhill from the 16th and then the 17th Amendment, uh, where the senators are no longer appointed by the, the representatives in their state. Uh, but I think those were the things that really set us on the wrong path. The uh, the nationalism, or however you want to, the, the the Civil War set that up. Those things didn't have to happen, but once those things happened, I guess it's just it's inevitable. And of course, the schools haven't helped because we don't really teach. You right. know, we don't really teach like you say those long train of abuses. We don't really teach what they talked about in the Constitutional Convention. You know how initially there was a top down plan presented, and it was just rejected right off the bat, we don't really talk about the anti-federalist. And it's yeah. funny, all of the phrases, all, excuse me, all of the clauses today that are used to justify federal power, necessary and proper clause, the uh, general welfare clause, supremacy clause, those are the ones that the anti-federalists specifically pointed out that they would be a problem. And of course, the federalists, as you know, they said, no, nah, that's you know, there's there those are those are not going to be a problem. And like you said earlier, the federal government only has the powers delegated. And oh, by right. the way, that Bill of Rights, a Bill of Rights would just be mere parchment barriers. And and yeah. actually, they were both right because the anti-federalist, all the clauses that they said would be used and abused have been, and the federalists were right, were right because the Bill of Rights in many cases have just been a parchment barrier because. People have to enforce them. Well, if people don't know the story behind it, they're not going to enforce it. They're not going to stand up for it. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You know, I think that the Federalists were right in a legal sense. If, like, if you look at their arguments during the ratification debates when they said, you know, this is what general welfare means. It doesn't mean what the anti-Federalists are saying. <clears throat> From a legal standpoint, Absolutely correct. That is the correct interpretation and meaning of the Constitution. Where the anti-federalists were, sure, they understood the propensity of government to grow and the propensity for power to expand. And when you read some of the stuff that they said, they, they were, I mean, prophetic is not too strong of a word. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, they, you're right. They were both right. And I think you make a very good point about the uh, the the income tax, the the way they changed the makeup of the Senate, 
And then that set the stage for the 1930s FDR, the New Deal, which really entrenched the welfare state and the administrative state. So you kind of had these these lurches forward uh, in terms of consolidation and uh, expansion of federal power. Consolidation, it's interesting because that was a word that was thrown around a lot during the ratification debates. And it was the greatest fear. Nobody wanted what they called consolidation. And consolidation really just means all power being centralized into one general government. <laughs> and the anti-federalist warned over and over again that the consolidation of the government was going to be the result of the Constitution. And the, the federalists were like, no, no, that's not going to happen. We don't want consolidation either, but we've put things in place to prevent that. We've got these limits on federal power and everything's going to be okay. The problem is, is just as you said, it's a parchment barrier. You can't expect a piece of paper to limit a government. <laughs> Ultimately, it comes back to it's up to the people. The British government wasn't going to be limited by rhetoric. It required the colonists to stand up and draw a line in the sand and say no. And it's the same today. Some things don't change. The nature of power don't doesn't change. And so... Really, the failure of the Constitution, if, if there has been a failure, and a lot of people will say there is, the failure of the Constitution has been not in the Constitution itself, but in the people's unwillingness to enforce it. And that ultimately is the responsibility of the people. You know, they, they, I've heard it said you get the government that you ultimately want. And sadly, I think that's true in a lot of cases. I think a lot of people like big, overreaching government because they feel like, we can control this and we can get stuff done. Yeah. But the lesson is always that you're not going to always control it. And your enemy is going to have that power. It's going to have those levers in its hand at some point. And at that point, you're going to be in trouble. So you're better off just to limit it as much as you can, stand up and say no whenever it overreaches those bounds. Absolutely. So how do the uh, abuses during the revolution or prior to the revolution, how do they compare to what we experienced at the hands of the federal government today? Well, a lot of them are the same. Again, I really encourage people to take that time during this 4th of July holiday to read those those complaints that are listed out in the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that uh, it said, and he is the king in this sentence, he, the king, has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with many firmness his invasion of the rights of the people. And we don't really see, you know, it's not like that they, they've come and literally dissolved state legislatures. That's Washington, D.C. hasn't done that yet. But they do basically just using the courts and, and using uh, executive orders, they do override states all the time and effectively basically just dissolve, you know, the things that the states have done with, within their own prerogative and rights. So, you know, maybe not quite a literal uh, interpretation of that, but certainly figuratively the, uh, the government's done that. And then this one's my favorite. He has erected, to, erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. If that isn't the FDA, the DEA, the FBI, the IRS, yep. every alphabet agency that you can imagine, you know, uh, it wasn't too long ago that they, they funded, what, 84,000 new IRS agents? Talk yep. about a, a, a swarm of officers to harass us and eat out our substance. Uh, I, I think that that is the most poignant of, of all of the, of the complaints. But you, if you go read the list, and I really can't encourage people to do it, you'll see that there are a lot of parallels, and you're going to kind of go, ooh, <laughs> you know, what, what exactly did we fight this revolutionary war for? We ended up with uh, kind of the same thing in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, here's the thing. We do have some options they didn't have, okay? They did not have, you know, they didn't have a written constitution, and, and they had to actually physically fight uh, to, to break away. We do have a written constitution. We have a Second Amendment. If, if we have to use it, we do have it. But we also have a Tenth, and, and we also have the Ninth, and, and we have the structure of the Constitution. If enough of us understand it, and if we can change that mindset of federal here, state does what the federal says, 
counties do what I mean that's we got to do away with that somehow we got it, it's it's not a matter of we don't need to change anything in the Constitution we just need to understand the original intent and push it back you know push back on it so I mean I really think that if before we resort to a Second Amendment solution which will be ugly for everybody um, Tenth Amendment nullification I I think that is the way to go, uh, and I Absolutely. think the sooner the better. Yeah, I think, number one, education is key. What we're doing right now, this is important. It's important for people to understand because our school systems have failed us in terms of teaching history, teaching the Constitution, teaching that you know government should be limited. The, the government schools have created a government narrative that benefits the government. Yeah. That's the sad reality. So it's incumbent upon us who do understand, who do know, to educate our friends and our family and to do things like this. But you're absolutely right. Nullification. And this is just the idea that states and localities and even individuals have the power to stop the encroachment of federal power by, as I already mentioned, James Madison recommended in Federalist Number 46, a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. It's a fantastic first start. And we know it works because we've seen it work. And, you know, it's the spirit of resistance that we saw during the Stamp Act where they refused to comply. We can do this without having to resort to violence at all and, and drive a significant amount of change. And... We've seen this uh, absolutely, probably the most powerfully in the fact that the federal government still claims that you cannot have marijuana. And most of the states at this point, 38 states to be precise, have at least legalized medical marijuana at this point despite federal prohibition. I don't care what you think about marijuana. It's a state issue. Federal government has no authority to regulate a plant. And if you doubt this, ask yourself why it required a constitutional amendment for the federal government to regulate alcohol in the, in the 1920s. It's Good because point. there's no constitutional authority. And as more and more states have embraced marijuana, either completely or at least for medical purposes, they have stopped enforcing that federal law. Well, the federal law is no longer enforced. And you can take that model and you can apply it to so many things. If the federal, if the states stop enforcing federal gun control, it's not going to get enforced. The ATF does not have the personnel and resources. If states stop enforcing EPA mandates, they're not going to get enforced. If the states stop enforcing medical mandates, they're not going to get enforced. Interestingly, I just, uh, <coughs> I just wrote an article today about a new law that passed in Vermont that legalizes what they call. Um, <coughs> Addiction treatment centers, a place where people can safely go. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are a place where people can safely go and use illegal drugs in a safe environment, get resources that they need to treat addiction, and then uh, hopefully get off of the drugs. This has been successful in other countries, but the federal government prohib prohibits it. It is illegal per federal statute. And Vermont basically just said, I don't care what the federal government says. We're going to do this anyway. We need more attitudes like that. And again, it doesn't just have to be drugs. I know a lot of people don't, <laughs> you know, aren't going to be favorable to that particular issue. Right. But imagine this applied to an issue you do care about. Again, yeah. gun control, sound money. Tennessee has really done a great job in doing some things to support sound money. Uh, they just actually passed a law recently where uh, the states can, can now keep uh, some of its – uh, monetary reserves in gold and silver to yep. protect them from the deprivations of inflation. So we need more of, of these kind of creative state options that refuse to cooperate. And again, it also comes down to people refusing to cooperate. You know, I, I, I've I, sometimes I'll joke around with my my gun friends because a lot of folks that are in the Second Amendment movement are are, are pretty compliant to to law. They're very respectful of the law, and that's fine. But I joke that, you know, the weed people have a way more guts than you guys do because they just do it anyway. You know, they're not waiting for federal federal permission. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, you know, uh, Florida passed a, a 
constitutional carry bill uh, a year ago. So I can I can carry now without a permit. It didn't change my life one bit. I was carrying without a permit long before. <laughs> so, and, and obviously that was at my risk. And people have to kind of consider, okay, where am I willing to draw lines? Right. Where am I willing to say I'm not going to comply? And don't come at me with this. Well, you've got to respect the law because I've seen y'all drive. <laughs> yeah. I know for a fact that most people are not respecting the speed limit. And you know, that's a great example of nullification by individuals. The speed limit says 65. Everybody's driving 75, 85. You get some guy going 90. And yeah, the police can pick off one person. But there's absolutely no way on the planet that they can make everybody drive that speed limit unless they put some kind of governor on the car. I think that's probably coming, but that's a that's a whole different discussion. You know, on the I, issue of guns and the federal government, so the ATF, I don't even know after Bruin how the ATF still exists, at least the firearms portion, okay? I, I don't understand right. that. I mean, you know, the Bruin decision pretty much said, and I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a big fan of live by the courts, die by the courts. But okay, that's the game we've played in the Bruin, uh, in the Bruin decision. They said that the restriction did not exist in 1791, then you can't apply it now. Now I have a problem right. with the federal government telling the states that one way or the other, but we've been playing that game. And, and so in that, going along with that, I don't see why, how we even still have an ATF that's, that's focusing on firearms issues. So, right. It, it seems to me like the ATF is nullifying the Constitution, if you follow that mindset. If, if, if you, so, and the other thing is, you know, our states, there are a lot of things that individuals have to do. You know, we have to make our own decisions on what we're going to go along with. We really have to get our states involved. So if our states were willing to step up, and let's say in the case of the ATF, and, and I know not all uh, people who own gun stores would agree with this, but... This whole thing about having to have a federal background check, that's garbage. Yeah, That's garbage. Our state should step in. They should declare these, okay, if you, we're going to give you a state license to operate. You're a state store. We're not, you, you, if you're going to check with anybody, you're going to check with us. You're not, you, know, you should not have to do the work of the federal government, the illegal, unconstitutional work of the federal government. Uh, so... But bottom line is in a lot of these things, we'll have as much federal tyranny as our states will comply with. And exactly. so unfortunately, all of our states the very, are way too complicit with the garbage coming out of D.C. And so I, I think that's an area we had to put focus on. We had to start looking, okay, you know, a lot of them talk a good game, but then you look and see what they're actually pushing. So... They may be suing the federal government on an issue, and at the same time, they're still promoting that program. Right. You get a lot of that. So let's end with some good news along those lines to see the impact of when states do step up. A couple of years ago, there was a, a, a movement to create a firearms code that would um, be present on any credit card transaction involving a firearm or ammunition. Mm -hmm. And there has been so much blowback at the state level. There's been 13 or 14 states that have outright prohibited the use of these firearms codes by any uh, <clears throat> financial institution operating in their states. That pushback was so strong that they basically put the whole thing on pause. And, and I don't think it's going to come back because they've recognized that they overstepped and they're not the states are not willing to allow uh, credit cards to be used to track firearms purchases. So there you see the power of the states when when enough of them step up. Another place where I, I see this happening is there's a lot of states now that are pushing back against the whole idea of a central bank digital currency, yep. which would be a, a digital currency issued by the um, the Federal Reserve. It's hard to believe, but it would be actually worse than the fiat currency that they're issuing today. It would create a mechanism where where the government could literally track all of your transactions, you know, from buying a cup of coffee to buying a rifle. And again, we've seen a number of states that have stepped up and, and have looked for creative ways to block the implementation and the, the effectiveness of a CBDC, CBDC within within the state. So... That just goes to show that, that when there's enough 
number one, public pressure on state representatives to do the right thing. They'll get the right thing done in a lot of cases, and it's a very powerful – it can affect change. You know, And again, everything from, from weed to guns, this can be effectively used. And uh, I love putting those two issues together because it kind of brings together a, a very di- diverse and divergent group of people. But the good news is the states do have significant power. Play, even playing within the Supreme Court game, as, as you mentioned – the federal government has held consistently since 1842 that the states cannot be compelled to enforce a federal law or implement a federal program. Yeah. They don't have to do it. So if they don't have to do it, they should stop doing it. And when they stop doing it, a lot of this stuff's not going to get enforced anymore. So we do have power, and we have seen it work, and we know it can work. We just need more people to focus their attention and efforts at these state levels and pay more attention to what's going on at the state legislature. We get so wrapped up in, you know, the presidential election and Congress and all of that stuff. And I'm not saying don't pay attention to that at all, but I am saying you need to pay just as much attention to what's going on uh, in Nashville or Tallahassee or Indianapolis or Atlanta as you do to Washington, D.C., because those folks in those state legislatures have a great deal of power and they are much more subject to public pressure than your congressman or your senator. Yeah, we'll never fix D.C. by, by conventional means or by voting. Uh, it, it'll have to be fixed by the states putting them back in check, and that's only going to happen if we force our states to do that. Hey, thank you for coming on. Thank you for all you do, and i love to have you back sometime. And there's information up here. You're on the Tenth Amendment Center. And uh, <clears throat> so I just want to thank you again. I hope you have a, a great Fourth of July. And... Hope you're around to write another, uh, was it 14,000 articles? Or no, 5,000 articles. Five, it was 5,000 5, articles in, in 14 years. So hopefully we'll get another 5,000 articles out of you. All right. Well, we'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> we'll keep plugging along at any rate. All right. Well, I do really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. On that note of nullification, if you want our state to stand up to federal overreach, the best way to do that is support the nullification process bill sponsored by Senator Bowling and Representative Holsey that they intend to bring back next session. Visit tncss.weebly.com slash call to action, sign the petition, and follow the instructions on the link. Our state senators and reps need to know we want this legislation pass when they return in January. Now is also the time to get candidates for state office on record as well. D.C. will never fix D.C. Only the states can fix D.C. And we have to demand that our states stand up to D.C. and uphold their oath to the U.S. and Tennessee Constitution. I want to thank you all for taking the time to watch our program tonight. Please be sure to hit the like and subscribe button as well as the notification bell so that you never miss a show. Tennessee Informer is available to listen as an audio podcast on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, and other popular podcast platforms. You can find them on our website, teeninformer.com. And while you're there, please take a moment to sign up for our newsletter. Stay up to date. We really need more people to sign up for this weekly newsletter. We would greatly appreciate that. It doesn't cost you anything. The subscriptions to Tennessee Informer don't cost you anything. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Just search for at TN Informer. Please share us with your friends. That's it for now. Good night from Paris, Tennessee, that is. (laughs) 